All right, Miss Kathy's here to get it to get us squared away. We're about to get started. Let's make sure you have notes. Uh, if uh, if for some reason you need all all the notes, just make sure you have tonight's notes. We're going to walk they through that. Okay, you hear? If if you want to put a, a special asterisk, uh, I don't know, make a smiley face with the tongue sticking out. That means you need a whole book, and Miss Kathy will make you one. All right, let me reset the table and then tell you what we are going to be doing this evening. All right, so the, the last two weeks, we're two weeks. Okay, thanks. We are two weeks in. Uh, spiritual disciplines, we've been looking at a pursuit of how to read your Bible, okay? And we began with the, with the truth that sometimes reading the Bible is difficult um, because it's a Big, big book, 66 different books, and there's a story that goes along with it. Um, there are different genres that we read, and uh, there's, there's a context. Some books just jump in. Some books have, some of those genres are apocalyptic or epistles where you're only getting one side of a phone conversation. So we just began to kind of... Uh, walk through some of the complexity and, uh, if I'm honest, why uh, a lot of people struggle to read their Bible. I have a tremendous amount of sympathy uh, for that, particularly because my own father really struggled to read the Bible. There were a number of times where, where he would say to me, hey, you preachers say just read your Bible, and I try and read my Bible, but I don't understand a whole lot of it. And so... Just knowing that God has gifted me to have good reading comprehension, um, you know, it just breaks my heart. I really wanted my father to be able to, to know and meet the Lord in, in that way. And so, uh, what not. All right, so reading the Bible can be difficult. And so we've spent uh, the, last, the last half of the first section and all of last time, and I just tried to give you guys some quick, broad movements of the Scripture, okay? Quick, broad movements of the Scripture. Um, that little piece is only, uh, in, in fact, in, in going through that, what, uh, I knew this, but I realized that much more. That we're probably going to do a whole class, probably next spring, of just walking through those really broad movements of how to understand the Bible that you guys got a glimpse of last class period. I can do that with 10 other subjects as you kind of walk through major movements and themes of the Bible that really help you uh, put handles on and understand the story of the Bible um, and give a lot of context for how you're supposed to interpret particular sections, okay? That's all the time that we have in this short class uh, because this class is about spiritual disciplines. And so this evening, we're going to make it, uh, uh, we're going to walk through. I'm going to spend the first half trying to give you a compelling vision on how we're supposed to read the Bible. In fact, what the Bible says about itself in how and why we're supposed to read it, the attitude that we're supposed to approach the Bible with when we read it, and then we're going to do it together. We're going to walk through an example passage I had you guys read out of uh, Exodus chapter 32 a couple weeks ago, and what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this together, okay? And we're going to do a sample Bible reading, all right? So this first half um, is going to be a complete process of us looking at what the Bible is, what it says about itself, and, uh, and how we're supposed to approach it. Because when we understand what the Bible is saying about itself, it's going to come with it a particular attitude and a particular focus that this is how you should be reading your Bible week in, week out, okay? Uh, by the way, what I've done is I've essentially surveyed this entire book for you in about six pages worth of notes, okay? So you don't have to read it. You're welcome, okay? You can read it. It's great. It has more detail than what I give you, but that's, that's what this quick overview comes from. All right, 
Meeting God when you read the Bible. Seeing, savoring, and being transformed. Okay? That the highest aim of anything we do, and particularly when we read the Bible, the highest aim is to see the glory of God. To be captivated by the glory of God. To do everything that we can for the glory of God. And when we see it, we will be transformed by it. Okay? That's what the Bible says, actually. Look, that's actually the promise of our hope and our faith. 1 John 3, 2. That when he comes, you will see him as he is. Okay? And then you're going to be changed. I'm going to be changed because I see him as he is. That's what it says. Right? Look at that. When he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. All right, so that's the thesis. That's what I'm about to prove over this next 30 minutes, all right? So seeing, why is this so important? Because man is naturally blind to the truths of God, that they are hidden to us. They are a mystery because of our fallen nature, because of our sinful nature, because of our flesh. We are blind to the truths of God and to who he is naturally, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 12, uh, uh, 20 through 21, God is speaking about all the wisdom of the world. And he begins to survey, right? And he does with the, the Greeks and the Jews. And he says, how by the wisdom of man did anyone ever come to conclude that God was going to die on a cross did anyone come to that conclusion? In fact, it's the exact opposite, right? Man, in all of his wisdom, turns out to be foolish. As smart as man is, he never figured out God in true wisdom. You see, the Greeks, they seek for knowledge, and the Jews, they seek for a sign. And what's incredible about this whole context here as you're working through uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is... You think about, he's, he's talking about the Jews, the Jews who have the scripture. We're going to come back to this point in a moment. They have the scripture. They read the scripture, and they still have no clue about God's wisdom, right? Because in large part, it's veiled to them, right? Ephesians 3, 4, 5, and 8. You can see him here. By referring to this, when you read, okay, Paul is writing, He's talking about the mystery of Christ. So this mystery of Christ, you see it highlighted there, the mystery of Christ. Paul is saying, when I'm writing, I am revealing the mystery of Christ. I want you to understand my insight to the mystery. So why would Christ be referred to as a mystery? Well, in part because... It is a mystery that is ultimately revealed through the power of the Spirit, through the coming of the Son. No one understood what God was up to, what he is doing. Okay? And through the prophets, all right, so through the apostles and prophets, you can now see and understand through the Spirit this mystery revealed. But in fact, you're supposed to look back at the prophets and read them differently now. Now that you have the light of Christ. So when we read, everything is supposed to be through the lens of the riches of Christ Jesus. All right, Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. Paul is praying. Look at this. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Think about that language he's using. Because he's talking about spiritual eyes. Paul is praying for believers to have spiritual eyes. That our spiritual eyes would be open, that we would be able to see Christ more clearly. That's his prayer for us. Okay? And so as we approach the Bible, it's in this vein of I cannot see with my own natural eyes. I need spiritualized. I need help that comes from the Lord in order to be able to see. So it's a mystery that is revealed. The New Testament authors saw this mystery. This is how they articulate that we saw the glory of Jesus and we have written 
so that you can see it too. Look at a couple of these passages. John 1.14, you see it there. The Word became flesh, tabernacled amongst us, and we saw His glory. We saw it. Even in the miracle of turning the water into wine, we saw His glory. At the end of the Gospel of John, what does he write? He says, look, there were many other miracles that Jesus performed. In fact, we couldn't even fit them all in one book if we wrote them all down. But the ones that we did write down, you know why we wrote them down? So that you could see it and you would believe. That's why we wrote these down. You see, it's all towards a seeing that you would see with spiritual eyes that that that. The, the blinders would begin to come off and that you would start to be able to comprehend who Christ is and so that you would believe. John does a similar thing in 1 John. Listen to what he says. This is his introduction to 1 John. Look at the language he used. I underlined it and read there for you. Hey, what we have heard, what we've seen with our own eyes, what we looked at, what we touched, seen, heard again, again. It was manifested to us. All of that, we proclaim it to you so that you may have fellowship with us. These things we're writing down. That's what the Bible is. Written eyewitness accounts written down. Why? So that you would have belief too. So that you could see what we have seen. Okay? And so through this most ordinary act of reading that we may see the wonderful reality of God himself. Okay? You can continue to move through. By the way, I've given you a lot of scripture passages. A lot of this is so you can go back and you can study it when you have a little more time. I've been told that my class is like drinking from a fire hose. I get that. All right, using a lot of scripture, making a lot of the same points. What you'll see here in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, again, that, that the Bible is God's spoken wisdom. All right, it's written out for us, this mystery that was hidden. But now the apostles are speaking it, and these words is what we have recorded in scripture. All right. It's not human wisdom, but it's wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God. And then one more final verse, flip the page. Incredible passage out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about those who are unbelievers who are reading the Bible, but they have a veil over their face. And they read it, and they do not understand, and they do not see. But then when you come to Christ, the veil gets removed. Okay? What is all of this talking about? It's talking about seeing. So that, here's, here's what we're building. So that when you approach the Bible, you are coming with a certain lens. This is how the Bible is arguing that you should come to it. Okay? And not just seeing. This next thing is also savoring him. It's a step further than just seeing. Why? Because let's think about this question for a second. How on earth did the religious leaders not get it when Jesus showed up? I mean, doesn't that just scare you to death? The people who read the Bible more than anyone else, and then God himself shows up, and they want no part of him. Like, how did they miss it? Well, Jesus specifically addresses them here in this passage, John 5, 42 through 47. And what he says to them is basically because they're self-righteous, because they love power and the approval of men. They're after the approval of men that God himself shows up and they don't recognize him. I mean, what a warning that you can read the Bible no more Bible than anyone else and not know him. So it's not just seeing, it's savoring, right? Savoring because the scriptures don't want us to simply read, right? It's not intellectualism. It's not even emotionalism. It's not just a bunch of facts. 
to win Bible quizzes. And look, some of that stuff's good. It's great, right? But we can so easily miss it because ultimately it's all about knowing him, a window. Piper has an incredible illustration that the Bible is a window. And as you see through it, you see the beauty of the, of the setting or the rising sun. And that magnificence of God himself so compels you that you just want to keep going back to that window. That's what the Bible is. And ultimately, that's what the Bible's going to, going to tell us about God, right? So the scriptures command that God be our delight. That God is your delight. Did you know that the scriptures command your affections? Delight in him. You can't say, well, I don't really feel like it. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's a command. Delight in him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Be glad in the, in the Lord and rejoice. To God, my exceeding joy. You know, you, you are commanded to fight for those emotions. You are commanded to uh, meet God in the scripture and to Fight for that. That's why I told you my, part of my regular practice is, is I'm always reading through the Psalms because this, this forces me to always ask the question. I ask the same question of my marriage. Am I in love with my wife? I don't mean do I do things that prove I love her. That's part of it. But I ask myself the question, am I in love with her? You know the difference, right? Am I in love with her? And, and the times where the register comes up like, I don't know. I don't really like her that much right now. I don't know. Usually, usually it's because I'm just so stinking busy or something like that where you just, you, you kind of drift apart. It's life. This is real marriage. This is real talk, right? I, there's no newlyweds in here. We can be truthful, right? Okay, so this is just the way it is. So what do you do? You lead your heart to love her. It's the same with the Lord. Do you delight in the Lord? Are there times in your life where you're like, you know what, I'm not that passionate about God right now. Well, that should scare you like it does me. And you should go back to the scriptures and the scriptures commands you delight in the Lord, okay? That he would be your passion and this is what you do. And so here's a list of scriptures, right? All through one of my favorite, Philippians 3, 7 through 11, right? Just knowing Christ. I want to know him. I want to be found in him. I want to know the fellowship, even of his sufferings, just to be found in him and not in any other thing. And the scripture would also tell us to long for God's word. See that there? Jesus says, I've spoken these things to you so that you would have joy in them. And Peter on the backside says, he, he calls us to long for the pure milk of the word. So first step is just seeing, okay? The Bible says that you need to see. It's actually, uh, there's an expectation in the Bible that you see. Did you know that? This is the way the Bible argues, even against non-believers, against all of creation. You should see and you should know. God has placed innate knowledge inside of every one of us. There is uh, a creator. There is a power that is around. His invisible attributes have been clearly seen. You should see. And you are responsible for seeing. And then, when, when G, and then when you read God's word, you should see. And when Jesus appears, you should see. You say, but I struggle with seeing. That's okay. We all struggle with seeing. But that's the compelling argument. Okay. And then finally, so see, savor. It's not just facts. There's a savoring. But ultimately, to be transformed. That when we see and when we savor the magnificence of God, we will be transformed by it. All right, warning. This transformation is not first outward behavior, but inward. Because doesn't Jesus tell the Pharisees in Matthew uh, 23, you are whitewashed tombs. You look so good on the outside, but you're dead bones on the inside. Okay? It's why this class is the third part in a discipleship trek. And we began with the gospel. And we dug deep, deep, deep into the gospel. And then we moved on to your spiritual identity. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. It's your identity. This is who you are. And then you get to spiritual disciplines. Right? 
because we are so prone to make it all about outward behavior, but it's all about the inward part. So the command here is that when you see, if you really see and if you really savor, you will be changed. Okay, so God's aim is to transform you. You can see it right here, Romans 8. We know this, Romans 8, 28. We know this verse, right? God causes all things to work together for our good. And then he starts a, a chain, right? Those whom he uh, foreknew, he predestined. Then, listen to this, to become conformed to the image of his son. Did you know that's God's plan in your life? That you would look more like Jesus. That's what he wants from you. He wants you to bear fruit for the glory of his name. All right? It's going to take some work for you to look more like Jesus, isn't it? But that's his aim. He's working for eternity. He's got a long way to go, but he's going to keep chipping away. Okay? But look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. This is an incredible verse. Same section where it talked about that veiled face, but then the veil gets removed. So here he says, With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, Right? We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And then look at that next statement. Disconnected casual glimpses of glory do not transform. Disconnected casual glimpses doesn't transform. But here it says, when you behold the glory of the Lord you will be transformed. Okay? Why do we need this? Well, because even, even though you're a born-again believer, even though you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're eternally alive, you still have deceitful desires. You still have the flesh. Okay? Even darkened understanding. That's what the Scripture would say of you. And me, right? You guys remember Paul's section in Romans 7? He's like, I try to do this thing. I try to live it out, but I keep doing what I don't want to do. Wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free? Okay, that old section is pointing towards your need to abide in the Spirit and rely upon the Spirit. And in fact, particularly early on in your Christianity, that you will feel stuck in mud. You will struggle like crazy because you don't yet know how to abide in the Spirit. And so there will be times in your life where God just lets you spin your wheels until you learn to abide in Him. Okay? Why? Because you still had the flesh. Okay? And on top of that, you have an enemy who blinds you. He is a liar. He deceives the whole world. Think about that statement. He deceives the whole world. The whole world is deceived by him. Well, how much like the world are you? He twists God's word. He snatches God's word away, and he blinds unbelievers. Okay? So this is why when we approach the Bible, when we read it, we have to have this mindset, right? That is, it's not about facts or historical curiosity. It's not about winning doctrinal arguments. How many of you have picked up God's word just to win an argument with your buddy? Okay. Yes, that stuff's important for understanding, but the reality is, is the Bible wants you to approach it so that your, the eyes of your heart might be enlightened to see the glory of God, and you and I might be transformed. Okay. So we should approach God's word with humility. You know why the Pharisees didn't get it? Because they weren't willing to be changed by it. They weren't willing to be humbled by it. So you approach God's word with humility. Final page. Flip it over on the back. Supernatural and natural act. All right, this is where we're landing. So here's how it works. In our obedience... In our work to do the natural act of reading, God promises to meet us there and give us his supernatural wisdom and revelation. Look at that first verse. Think on what I say. Right? That means roll up your sleeves, think about it, wrestle with it. Some of the, some of the 
Paul's sayings are hard. Even Peter says that. That Paul, he's hard to understand. Okay, so think about it, but then look at what it says. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Okay, and then you got a couple of verses there that just show this is, this is the way it is in the Christian life. You are called to be obedient. You're called to show up and be faithful, but you're also called to understand it's not your faithfulness. It's God's power. God promises to meet you there. You do that first step, but if God doesn't show up, nothing good happens. But God's promise he will show up. Okay, so in summary, this is what we would say. We have a need to see because we are blind. And the Bible has been written so that we can see not just facts and historical events, but so that we can behold God's glory. And through that savoring, we will be transformed. So we do the hard work, we roll up our sleeves, but this is our prayer. This is our attitude, okay? Always as we approach the Scripture. Now, I said all of that because I'm going to give you really simple handles or questions for daily Bible reading and what it's going to look like. And we're going to do it on the board and we're going to journal. But you must remember everything I've just expounded in, in simple principles, right? God, I want to see you today. When I come to your word... I want to see you. God, will you show me yourself? Like Moses, will you show me your glory? Would you do that, God? Would you help me to understand? God, it can be easily confused, and I'm not able to piece everything else together. But God, would you, would you reveal things in my life? You know, I've just found consistently, guys, over time, he's been faithful to do that in my life. He's been faithful. I mean, just this, just this week, I've got, I, I brought my little, my little journal so I could walk through. Just, just this week, yesterday, just sitting and, and writing, reading, uh, reading God's word, and, and only got like, I don't know, a fourth of the way through the scripture passage and through everything I'm about to show you, and I just had to stop because I felt the Lord showing me something and convicting me of something and then just writing out a prayer. And, it, and it's, just, it's just the sweetest thing, right, to have the Lord show you, speak to you, convict you. When the Lord convicts, he heals. And so just to be able to get some of that off, right? So God is faithful to his word. It's why it's been written. And if we approach it with that vein and with that prayer, will he not be faithful to meet us there and to show us amazing things? Okay. Amen? Yeah. All right, with that said, we now have, uh, I've given you a sheet of simple questions and categories for us to think through as we read God's Word, okay? And so, how about this? Let me give you a five-minute wiggle break, all right? And then we're going to come back, we're going to walk through uh, Exodus chapter 32, and on the board, we're going to just ask these questions and do this application, all right? As a practice sample, I'm at home reading my Bible time. What should this look like, okay? So you've got, you've got five minutes to wiggle. Because it's not an hour and 15 minutes. I know, it's like an hour and a half. Well, you get wiggle time in the singing. You need, you need me to start You need me to start giving you wiggle time during the sermon? No, do not give me wiggle time. Should have given you last week that showed the animated video that showed the whole story. Where did you get that? Search true and better. True and better? Mm hmm. Uh, maybe true and better Jesus or something like that. Let me show you what comes up. Yes, you did. 
There's a song, and then it's the first video. Dan Stevers. That was good, it was good. Me. Yeah, I did the, uh, uh, I did that worship chart, and I gave them the worship chart, so that way, because we, we saw the movement from Old Testament, Jesus is the fulfillment in the New Testament, and then so the idea was, now next time we can ask the question, how does the Old Testament law transfer into the New Testament? So we saw a major movement, and we saw where, where things changed, where they were fulfilled, and where they changed. But what, would we say that of the entire law? So the law says, don't murder. Does that mean that goes away? Is that fulfilled in Christ? And so next time, we're going we're gonna to walk through how are we to understand the Old Testament into the New Testament, the Mosaic law into the New Testament. Okay. You did kind of a brief version of that before, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it hasn't been as organized as, as where we have it now. That chart, I just came up with that chart uh, uh, pretty recently. Uh, so it, it's... So you're going to do follow-up next week? Yeah. All right, your wiggling time is up. I forgot to mention uh, when we started. I forgot to mention when we started. Uh, we're recording. We, we recorded last week, and we're recording tonight. And uh, Robbie's going to post those um, online on our sermons page. There'll be a little uh, little picture of our spiritual disciplines, and then these will be recorded on there. So I apologize. I don't have the first week. Because uh, we didn't think of it then, um, but so we recorded last week. If you want to go back and watch that, and then we're recording this evening. Okay, all right. Exodus thirty-two. I uh, I given you guys uh, the homework of reading that, so it should be a little fresh in your mind. I'm going to give us a quick synopsis of the story, so it's even more fresh in your mind. Because some of you might have read it two weeks ago, 
And I know how things even uh, a week ago can slip out when you're sleeping. So two weeks ago, my, my, today is Wendy, so it's tough. It's tough. All right, Exodus 32. Uh, where are we in the story? Right? So they've made the exodus from Egypt. All right, that ended in chapter 14. They've made it to Mount Sinai. They're supposed to worship God there. They do that. And now Moses goes up on the mountain. Uh, in, in, in the Exodus reading, there's been a lot of, uh, hey, Moses, while you're up there, do this and this and this. Uh, the Ten Commandments are given. Um, and then other stuff. All right. Now, while Moses is up there, Exodus 32, he stays up there. And uh, they had no clue where he was, all right, because he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And they're like, um, what's happened? So they begin to ask the question. It's very interesting when you pay attention. It. They go to Aaron and they say, come make a God who will go before us. Where is this man, Moses? We don't know if he's coming back down. The man who brought us up out of Egypt. They really want that lead figure, okay? The man who brought us up out of Egypt. So Aaron says to them, tear off all the gold. All that gold that you got in the plunder of coming out of Egypt, tear that off. Okay? And they form it into, verse 4, a metal calf, a golden calf. And then he makes the declaration, this is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, when Aaron saw this, they built an altar and they started making sacrifice. And listen to what they said. Tomorrow we shall feast to Yahweh. You see that there? All right, so the next day they get up and they make burnt offerings and peace offerings. And then it says they even engaged in lewd behavior. Then we switch scenes. Then God says to Moses... Get down there at once. <laughs> now listen, God's language is very unique here. He says, he's speaking to Moses, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt. He says that to Moses. God says, Moses, get down there for your people who you brought up. Okay. And then God says in verse 10, Leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I might destroy them and start over and turn you into a great nation, Moses. Verse 11, Then Moses pleaded with the Lord. He replies, uh, God, why does your anger burn against your people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say that you brought them out with evil motives and that you got angry and you destroyed them? Remember Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, Israel here, he says. You swore by yourself right, that you would multiply their descendants. Verse 14, and so the Lord relented. And then Moses comes down. Him and Joshua meets Joshua. Joshua comes down with him, and they hear the sound of singing. And then Moses isn't too happy about it. Moses' anger burns. Okay, He breaks the tablets. He took the calf. He burned it completely, ground it down to powder, threw it in the water, and made them all drink it. That sound like a good mom? <laughs> that was creative. <laughs> You're going to drink this. <laughs> then he turns to Aaron. What did the people do to you? This is, the, this is the best part of this. This is the most ridiculous part of the whole story. Moses confronts Aaron. What did they do to you? You know what he says? Like, well, well you know, they wanted, a, they wanted a, a leader. We didn't know where you were. But then, then they gave me all their gold. I just threw it in the furnace, and this, this calf came out. I don't know how that happened. I mean, it's most, it just did. I just threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Can you believe it? 
Then Moses tells them to pick sides. He stands before them. He says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And then they will go through with a sword. In verse 28, 3,000 men will fall that day. Then he says to the people in verse 30, I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sins. All right, so let's pause there. Exodus 32, quick synopsis. All right, so we've got questions. We're going to do this together on the board. All right, so what do we learn about God as we think and begin to interpret and meditate on this passage? What do we learn about God? He's deeply interested in what we're doing. Okay, right? He, he cares about what we would say. He cares about worship. All right, he cares about us, he cares about our hearts, our affection. He cares about what we worship. What else would we say? He's okay. All right. He, he had a holy anger here, didn't he? Okay, a holy anger. All right, let's meditate on that for a second. Do you think it's justified? Yes. Why is that? Because they went their own way. Yeah? I mean, let's think about this story. Let's think about, I mean, one, he would have, he would have a right just because he is the creator. He is. Okay? But in this situation, how much more, right? Why? Yeah, look at, look at all that he's just done, okay? All that he's just done. He gave them ten commandments. The first one is? Yeah, don't worship any other gods. Second one is? And don't make a blabbering idol. Don't do that, okay? Just had that. That was just a couple chapters prior, chapter 20. So they've got that. And they're like, man, that Moses has gone too long. All right, so he has a holy anger that is expressed here. What else could we say about God? He tested Moses. Okay. There's, there's a lot of interest. What do you mean by he tested Moses? There's a lot of interestingness. He tested his humility. How? I'm going to, uh, Gary, what I'm going to write down is slightly different. I'm going to write this, this question here. Does God change his mind? Okay, you might worry, you, you're going to work through this scripture passage, right? And you're going to be like, whoa, well, this is interesting. This is pretty odd. Okay, when you're at home, Write these questions down. You know what? This is a good one to chew on for six months. Okay? Or 60 years. Okay? As you think and as you work through and try and figure out what, what is going on in this scripture passage. Okay? And as you think about this one, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. All right, see if we can answer that. But that's a really important one, right? And as you're at home and you got a little journal and you're just writing, write these things down because you're trying to work. The whole point is God is revealing himself. God has allowed himself to be revealed. He wrote this story. He wanted it narrated in this particular way so that you would learn about him. And this is what he has preserved for us. So, all right, does God change his mind? Why would, why would he allow this to be orchestrated this way, all right? Anything else we want to say as we work through about God? He's a jealous God who doesn't want to share our affection. Yeah, great. So he's, he's caring about our worship. He has this holy anger. 
Okay, it, it certainly makes us think of, of this, right? It, and this is in the, uh, um, this is the first of the Ten Commandments, right? For I'm a jealous God. So, so this is going to be a category that, that you circle up and you, you want to think through. What, what does the Bible mean whenever it says that God is jealous? He is jealous over me and my affections, what I worship, my heart. Why would he use language like that? All right, let's move on to man. What do, what, what do we think? What is this? What do we learn about people, about mankind, God's creation? Okay, what do you mean by stiff neck? That's Bible talk. Yeah, we mean stubborn. Yeah? Okay. Okay, as I was thinking about it, it, it huh? Impatient. Yeah, forgetful. These are great. Okay, this I, I found it so interesting in, in the way that they 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 needed this man Moses. Right? Where's this man who led us out of Egypt? They wanted to see somebody. They wanted something in front of them that they could chase after. In my mind, it, it begins to link towards, remember, they're going to ask for a king later. Okay, they wanted to see that, and they, they, they ridiculously made a, a golden calf, and, and yet they, they link it to Yahweh. Here's Yahweh. I mean, they know it's not Yahweh, but like, they wanted to see something. Proof doesn't bring about faith. They had all the physical manifestations of God proving his existence, and it still didn't bring about faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it just, so it, in my mind, in my journal, I would, I would just be noting, like, like man wants to, he wants to see something. Some, at times put God to the test, like oh, I want to see it. This impatience, this where is it? And, and you just start to meditate, you just start to explore. Right? It's just interesting details that are in the text that we learn about mankind. Okay? Now, where are we in the story of the Bible? Well, I gave a little bit of that, of that grounding here, all right? but also we remember uh, we're, there's, there's going to be important movements and themes as we understand Israel, um, as we understand where we are in the story. And so, so because context, genre, storyline, all that matter, okay? When you're at home, just grounding it, trying to understand the storylines, trying to understand those overall movements. All right, read the text through the lens of the gospel. What does this text teach us about the gospel? Jesus. Does this text point us to Jesus? Yes. How? Well, I go back to your first or your, your tenth question up there. Does God change his mind? Uh -huh. And I was dwelling on something similar to that when God spoke to Moses and said, look at your people, Moses. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Moses flipped it and said, no, no because he's humble enough to just these are your people and don't make a nation after me. Mm -hmm. uh, these are your people. And it came to my mind the concept of transference. So God was doing all these wonderful things, but his tool to do them was Moses. And so the people have transferred their loyalty, their, their <laughs> love, their whatever, to Moses as opposed to God. So they were worshiping the gift, not the giver. And so the same thing can happen to us in the gospel with Jesus. Um, we can sit here and worship our blessing as opposed to worshiping where those blessings came from. They come from Christ. Man, all that's going on up there? 
It's a long day. But that's Who would have thought? Man, I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. I think that's very perceptive. Very perceptive. How else does this point us to the gospel? Moses interceded. Moses interceded. Okay, now let's think about this. And what we know and understand uh, in the whole picture of uh, the Bible. Remember where we were last week with the Exodus story? with one who is coming like Moses, who knows God face to face, okay? The promise at the end of Deuteronomy, you need another prophet like me. You should look for another prophet like me. Deuteronomy ends as we looked and there was not one. This, the prophet, I gave you those scriptures last week, the prophet, it shows up in the New Testament, right? People are like, who do people say that I am? Well, some people are saying you're the prophet the long-awaited one prophet that was talked about with Moses. So, uh, yes, you, you are right to understand that there is going to be a, a gospel typology pattern movement here where you read it and you should come away with, I'm sinful like these folks. I mean, they look like knuckleheads to me. You think, gosh, how fickle and impatient and forgetful are they? God just did amazing things for them. But we should, we should never read through the lens, right? We should remember the lens that we just started with at the very beginning, right? We are blind. We need God to show us to see to see amazing things about who he is and to transform us because when he shows us who he is, okay? That humility approaching the scripture allows you to say, yeah, they may have made some boneheaded mistakes, but I don't ever want to be like them, okay? I sure hope I have an intercessor who's like Moses, who doesn't turn me over uh, to the holy anger and jealous wrath of God when I worship the wrong things. I need an intercessor like Moses. Now, this begins to give you a perspective that allows you to go back and answer this question. Does God change his mind? Well, I think in this scripture passage, he's allowing himself to be portrayed. We know from other scriptures that God does not change his mind. He's not fickle like man. He's not confused does not change his mind like you or I. It's not like the wind blows. He's like, you know what? I, I feel good today. I'm going to do this. Right? That's not God. So why would he allow himself to be portrayed like this? This is called uh, uh, personification, right? Um, where, where, where God is allowed to be seen from human perspective. And in this case, God takes a side in the argument or discussion. He is the holy judge who is ready to bring his wrath. Thank God there is this one who intercedes, this priest who stands in the gap and says, no, don't, don't do that. Remember your word, remember your promises, okay? And in this section, you, you are to add this to the characteristics of God. There are other things that are going to balance out the characteristics of God so that you should not always think of him this way. But here, he is allowing himself to be portrayed so that it would be highlighted, I sure need an intercessor like Moses. And we have one, a greater one, one who sits at his right hand one who is an advocate. You guys went through the word advocate in the gospel series? Advocate's an incredible word. An advocate is, there's not just one who intercedes, an intercessor is one who stands in between. So, so it's like there's the judge, there's the, the plaintiff, 
uh, an intercessor stands in between. Hey, let me tell you about him. Hey, let me tell you about him. An advocate comes all the way to your side, is your lawyer and argues for your defense. That's an advocate, right? Moses interceding, being an advocate, standing in the way of, right? Incredible. So you start to meditate on that. You start to say, how do we see this passage through the lens of the gospel? Okay. And then how does it make me relate to God different? Okay. How does it make you relate to God different? Merciful. Yeah. How is he merciful, even though he got to be the bad guy here? Yeah, yeah. We, we could see what we deserve. We could see how we fall short. We see ourselves in, in their plight. And yet we realize he is also the one who provided the intercessor. Right? So he is merciful. He is holy and he is loving all at the same time. That's the gospel. He is both. Okay? Any other ways this, this helps you to relate to God? How many times in the gospel, in the Bible, does God change his mind? I don't know. You're not supposed to answer, ask those kind of questions on the spot. <laughs> Six. <laughs> You're a teacher, don't you know that? I'm coming, I'm coming to Wednesday morning. I'm just going to throw a squirrely one at you. I don't know how many times he changes his mind. There are a handful of times, and, and open theists use those passages uh, to try and argue that God does change his mind, that it is not fixed. Uh, but other passages argue so strong in the opposite that, that you would do much better to roll up your sleeves and to, to do some of the work that we're doing here and understanding what's going on and why God allows himself to be uh, personified as changing his mind because he's accomplishing something for us uh, versus just saying he doesn't know what's going on. Thanks a lot, Sadie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. See, Moses doesn't leave it. Like, he goes down and he does business, right? Which is a picture of Jesus, right? Because in Revelation, who comes back? It's Jesus, the same merciful Savior, the same one who stood in between. He is the one who comes wielding the sword, okay? And so that's what Moses does. He comes down and he's like, look, it's my side or their side. You're either, you're either with the Lord or not, okay? So, so yes, yeah. And so as you're at home, okay, and, and you're, you're reading and you're meditating on these things, you know what? Uh, you, uh, and, and, and then in man's the next one, right? What does this teach us on how we should, should interact with man? The whole time you're also listening for the Spirit of the Lord to prompt you in your life, God, if there is anything in me as I'm working through the text, I invite you to convict me. I invite you to show me in my life as I'm working through all these stiff-necked, stubborn, fickle people. God, if you see anything in me, would you call that to my mind? I have a different section uh, on my page where I just, as, as the Lord begins to prompt me of things, I just write those things down. It's over in the corner, right? So that, that I make sure I'm, I, I write that down. I, I sense as I'm working through this, yes, God, you see that in me, right? Because it's always an examination of myself. I want to see God. I want to know him. And I give him the privilege to speak into my life. And so you work, you work through these things. Right? And then on the back side, then you begin to make application for it, right? How are we called to confess and repent? Okay, do I fear the Lord? 
Do I fear the Lord? Do I, do I worship things that cause and bring my Savior to jealousy? And you work through those things and you, you, you have sections. I, I want you guys, so it is very helpful to write. Writing is a very powerful exercise as you're interacting with the Scripture uh, because it, it brings your focus. You can write it down for the next day. If the Lord convicted you of something, you have it written down. It's there for the next day, okay? Um, you're, you're working through things as you're working through the text, and your mind can see it and can read it, okay? It's very powerful. I also write out prayers when I'm done, okay, as I work through so this next part, it's just, look, this is just application. This is you asking yourself and asking the Lord, are there things I need to believe? Are there action steps I need to take? Are there things that God is calling me to do to change in response to the reading of his word, right? Seeing, savoring, and being transformed. That's why we're reading the text with humility. God, I want to see you. You've promised that if I could see you as you are, nothing would ever be the same. Will you give me more of a glimpse of that? I give you the freedom to convict me and just listen as he, as he speaks to you. The mark of a mature Christian is not someone who never has anything to repent of, it's someone who repents more often than others because they're constantly keeping short accounts with the Lord because the Lord is able to speak to you, to, to continue to weave out the things in our lives, okay? Because we, we do run back. And the shorter account, the more mature you are, the more you're able to confess and to repent. So it should be part of your regular practice, okay? God, what do you see in me? I want to see you more. I want to know you more. And, and I want to interact with these things. And as he brings things to your mind, write them down. Okay, write them down. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I told you earlier this week, I was, I was reading. I'm personally working through the book of Acts. Uh, I'm working through a couple different spots, but working through the book of Acts, I'm about halfway through. And I was just stopped in my tracks as I'm reading something about Simon uh, that knucklehead that tried to, to purchase the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit fell on, on uh, Samaria. Um, and, and the Lord just right then just, just convicted me of something in the way that I treat people, the way that I view people. And, and, and then I stopped. And then I just began to write out, write out a prayer to the Lord. And then there's something so incredible to get on the other side, right, knowing Jesus has brought this to my mind, and Jesus has dealt with me, and he is, he is, he's, right, he's forgiven me, but he's also given me the eyes to see uh, this sin that was rooted in there, and then has the ability to, to call it out. And then, he, and it's just so freeing to walk out the rest of the day and like, like knowing it's like he got a bath, you know, a good hot shower, like, amen, right? I, I feel clean, like God has, God has rooted something out of me, and you just know I, I feel closer to the Lord, like I, like I see the Lord, right? That's what we're talking about in just everyday, regular Bible reading. God promises to meet you there. I'm giving you practical steps, but it's a supernatural, it's a spiritual exercise. God has revealed himself, and he promises to meet us there, Okay? Does he not say, if you seek me, you will find me, okay? Will he be found faithful on that final day? Or will you have a long list of all the times you went to his Bible and he just wouldn't show up? <laughs> all, right. all right, I'm not saying it's not hard sometimes. I've given you, I've tried to give you guys a lot of resources in terms of study Bibles and understanding the storyline, and we're going to keep building a lot of those things. And if you have questions, all of that's good. But at the end of the day, if God has promised to meet you there, He's going to show up. He's going to convict your heart and show you incredible things, able to see Him. 
Okay? And that's what we want. We want to see him, the Savior, the lover of our souls. All right, so let's pray to that end. You're dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise to meet us there. We thank you for the disciples that have written it down for us, this account of your glory and preserved for us so that we can see your glory too, God. And we want to be changed by you. And so uh, we pray to that end. God, help us to be disciplined and to just do the simple things of setting aside time week in, week out to meet with you. God, and that you would speak to us and that you would allow us to see you more, God. Never let us get sidetracked. Yes, it's good to do pursuits and to understand your word and to do all those things, God, but ultimately the aim is to see you. Forgive us when we fall short of that. Uh, we love you. We thank you for this evening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.